Hey class, welcome back. All right, so we're going to continue on with our um, new text set of historical fiction. Um, yesterday we read uh, Baseball Saved, uh, Baseball Saved Us, and um, we're going to go on and start our next book, which is called The Bracelet. Okay, this is The Bracelet by Hos Hoshiko uh, Uchida. And the illustrations are by Joanna Yardley. Okay. And um, so, like I said yesterday, we've, we've already read a book um, about a boy who was sent to an internment camp uh, during World War II. Um, this book, The Bracelet uh, by Yoshiko Uchida, is about a girl during the Japanese internment. And uh, if you remember yesterday's story, um, an internment camp is where families and people are taken kind of like, I mean, they were prisoners for an amount of time. Um, so it could be stressful for families. It could be sad. Um, most definitely a challenge for anyone that is put into that type of situation. Okay, so this is going to be another story that's uh, similar so both books that we read, um, this one today and yesterday's story, um, they explore the same real historical uh, period, uh, but they tell different stories, okay? So the title is intriguing, so be thinking about that, the bracelet, and why it's significant here in this story. Um, the girl's name is Emmy. Um, so let's go ahead and read her story. The Bracelet by Yoshiko Uchida, illustrated by Joanne Yardley. Here's the first picture. All right. There's Emmy. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped the tears away quickly, but couldn't wipe away the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called. And Emmy knew they would have to leave their home soon. She looked around a room. It was empty now as the rest of the house. Like a gift box with no gift inside, filled with a lot of nothing. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how it had looked. Flowered chintz curtains at the, at the window, her clothes scattered everywhere, her favorite rag doll and teddy bear sitting on the chest. She could even remember how the whole house looked if she closed her eyes and kept, the, kept pictures of it inside her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to a prison camp because they were Japanese Americans. And America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were being treated like the enemy just because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent Papa to a prison, a prisoner of war camp in Montana just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They loved America, but America didn't love them back, and it didn't want to trust them. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe she thought uh, a messenger from the government would be standing there, tall and proper and buttoned into a uniform. Maybe he would tell them that it was all a mistake and that they didn't have to go to a camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Lori Madison, who was in the second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy, and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating. She hadn't come to show her a new dress or to ask her to go to the store with her either. She came with a gift, as though she'd come for a birthday party. But she wasn't wearing her good party dress, and she looked just as sad as Emmy felt. 
Here, she said, thrusting her gift at Emmy. It's a bracelet. It's for you to take to camp. How does the writer let us know what Emmy and Laurie's friendship was like? Think about that for a second. How does the writer let us know what Emmy and Laurie's friendship was like, I guess, before all of this happened. Okay, think about that. You'll get a chance to write your answer or type your answer into the document on Google Classroom here in a little bit, okay? All right, I'm gonna keep on moving forward. Lori helped Emmy put on the bracelet. It was a thin gold chain with a heart dangling on it. And, it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I'll never ever take it off, Emmy promised. Not even when I take a shower. Lori gave Emmy a hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered, but she really didn't know if she'd ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Lori again. She watched as Lori uh, walked down the block, turning and waving and walking backwards until she got to the corner. Emmy couldn't bear to watch anymore, and she slammed the door shut. When the doorbell rang again, it was their neighbor, Mrs. Simpson. She, she'd come to take them to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister Reiko called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so that she, could, so, so that she wouldn't um, have to carry them. They could take only what they could carry, and her two suitcases were already full. Each member, each family, had a number, had a number now, and um, Emmy put tags with their numbers, 13453, three, on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house, going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each one had looked when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for a last look at the garden Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations and bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say. And Mama would smile and put it in her best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare Papa was gone and Mama was too busy to care for it. It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas and mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutching bundles and suitcases tagged with family numbers. Some people were crying, but most just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down, and she wondered if everybody was as scared as she was. She touched the small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns with bayonets standing at every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anybody tries to run away? She asked her sister, but Reiko just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly. Maybe. So I want you to think, how might you feel if you were Emmy in this situation? How do you think you would react? How, you know, what would be some of the feelings that you might be going through if you literally had to leave your home, leave everything that you know behind, the people that you love, 
like your neighbors, your friends, and you were taken to a place like this, what do you think you'd be feeling? Keep that thought so you can type it into the document here in a minute. Okay. Soon it was time for everyone to board the buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to Tanforan race tracks, which the army had turned into a prison camp. As the bus started down the street, she knew so well. Emmy, Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed the Cato grocery store where Mama used to buy bean, bean curd cakes and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now, but Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, we are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are. But the army didn't seem to think so. The bus sped down the water's edge and crossed the Bay Bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Goodbye, Bridge, Emmy whispered. Goodbye, San Francisco Bay. Goodbye, Seagulls. Emmy glanced at her sister sitting next to her and could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Stupid army, Reiko was mutter muttering. Stupid war. And then... They were at the Tan Foreign race, race tracks. Um, there was a barbed wire fence all around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates to let the buses in and then closed them so no one could um, get out. They were locked in. Wow. They were assigned to Barrack 16, apartment number 40, and Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped them look for it. It wasn't among the mass of, of Army barrack buildings, barracks buildings around the uh, racetrack or in the infield. In fact, it wasn't a barrack at all. It was a long stable where horses had lived, and each stall had a number on it. Well... Here it is, Mr. Norma said as he came to a stall marked number 40. This is your apartment. Emmy and Reiko peered inside. Gosh, Mama, it's filthy. No matter what anybody called it, it was just a dark, dirty horse stall that still smelled of horses. And the linoleum laid over the dirt was littered with wood shavings, nails, dust, and dead bugs. There was nothing in the stall except three folded army cots lying on the floor. Mama tried to cheer them up. I'll have Mrs. Simpson send us some material for curtains, she said. It will look better when we fix it up. But Emmy could tell Mama felt just as bad as she did, and no one could think of anything more to say. Mr. Noma went to get mattresses for them. I'd better hurry before they're all gone, he said. He rushed off because he didn't want to see Emmy's mother cry. But she didn't cry. She just went out to, the, uh, to borrow a broom and swept out the dust and dirt and bugs. Do you think Emmy's mother was scared too? What does the author tell us about Mama's personality here? Hmm. Think about that. So you're going to let me know in a little bit when you type it in, you know, um, if you think Emmy's mama was scared. And if so, kind of explain that for me. OK. All right. Who's the next? OK. It was just after Emmy and Reiko had set up the army cots that she noticed. My bracelet's gone, Emmy screamed. I've lost my bracelet! Emmy looked in every corner of their stall and along the ramp that led to their stable. Mama and Reiko helped her, but no one could find it. 
it was getting dark, but Mama got out her flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they'd taken. The track was muddy and full of puddles. The rain had left the day uh, left the day before. They looked and looked, but they couldn't find Emmy Emmy's bracelet anywhere. Yikes. Here's the next one. Okay. It was time now to have supper at the grandstand. Emmy stood with Mama and Reiko at the end of a long uh, weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and a fork. But all she could think of was her bracelet. Already she'd lost the one thing that would help her remember her best friend. Emmy wanted to cry. The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Lori had both worn their, their red sweaters on the first day of school. They'd had matching lunch boxes, too. And after school, they'd gone to fly um, kites in the uh, vacant lot near home. Emmy could just see their red and yellow uh, kites dancing in the wind, and suddenly, Emmy knew she was remembering Lori that very minute right inside her head, just the way she could remember every room in her house in Berkeley. Maybe she, maybe, she thought, she didn't really need the bracelet to remember Lori after all. So right here in this moment, what just happened? Why is Emmy beginning to think differently about the bracelet? Hmm. Gotta let me know when you type it in that document. You know, what happened? And why is Emmy beginning to think differently about the bracelet? And about the fact that she lost it. Emmy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to a camp in the Utah desert. But Laurie would still be in her heart even there. Laurie would always be her friend, no matter where she was sent. And Emmy knew she would never forget Laurie, ever. So what do you think of, of this ending? Is Emmy still sad about losing the bracelet? Let me know what you think. That was a super sweet story. Definitely sad. Um, and, you know, normally we probably wouldn't be able to relate with Emmy because we'd never really experienced anything like that. But I think with us all being confined to our homes right now, um, we can kind of, you know, relate in some respect, you know, that it's totally different <laughs> being away from your friends and being away from those that you are used to seeing every day. Um, it can be very sad. Um, so this was a good story. So sweet. All right. So you have your document on Google Classroom that I need you to access now. And um, I'll have those questions typed in there just like yesterday. Go ahead and type your answers for each one of those. Um, and your written response today, um, I'm going to have you focus on both of these stories, okay? And so as you're focusing on yesterday's baseball saved us and today's the bracelet, um, you know, both of these were historical fiction stories about the same event in history. So what did you notice about these stories? How are they alike? How are they different? Okay, so on your document that uh, I'm going to have you access here in a minute, I want you to, down at the bottom, once you answer those like three or four questions that I have for you, um, I'm going to create a little box that has the bracelet on one side and uh, baseball saved us, kind of like a T-chart, okay? And I want you to write sentences explaining um, what this story was like and what this story was like. How are they similar? How are they different? 
Um, you know, like an example could say, you know, this story is about how discrimination feels. This story is about how it feels to lose what you love. Okay, so kind of give me at least two or three sentences explaining the similarities and differences of these two stories. Okay, um, and that would be our assignment for today. All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining in with me on our second day. I'm sure you're doing a great job at home with all of your activities, all of your work. If you need anything from me, let me know. Um, I love you all. I miss you all. And I will see you again tomorrow. Bye, guys.